Okay, so uh, moving on uh, to the next question, Dr. Hashmi. Um, I just wanted to make reference to a book that I read a long, long time ago called The Bible, the Quran and Science by Dr. Maurice Bukai. And uh, this was one of the first instances, and I think I must have read it like some 20 years back uh, when I was a student. Um, this was one of the very first instances where I came across uh, the, the idea of problematic hadith or the fact that when you compare the Quran and the hadith collection, um, uh, doctor, uh, in Dr. Bukai's words, uh, he said in the book that the Quran seems very reflective of a divine mind, but the Hadith collection is more of an accurate projection of all the prejudices of 7th century Arabia. Uh, would you agree with uh, this statement based on all the work that you've done uh, in your field of study? All right. So I would agree with the statement, although I would simply say that we need to take Dr. Bukai's work separately so um so his book now i have i've only read excerpts of it long long time ago but he's trying to say that uh he's trying to reconcile revelation and science as far as i know and say that there's certain scientific kind of quote unquote miracles in the quran it, it, it and you correct me if i'm wrong but that's my recollection of his book uh so i dis disagree with that completely that approach um however i do agree with the idea and this i'm saying as an islamic modernist um, is that when I read the Quran, to me, this feels divine to me. Whereas it, there, there's something special about it to me. It touches my heart. Now, may, maybe non-Muslim doesn't agree and that's fine. But to me as a Muslim, when I read the Quran, I'm inspired by it. And because I'm inspired by it, I think it's inspired. Meanwhile, when I read the Hadith literature, for the most part, I mean, there's some beautiful Hadiths here and there, of course. Um, and I'm sure you could compile them into a book, the, these beautiful Hadiths. But if you just open up the books of Hadith, I don't get the sense that they are inspired. Um, in fact, I find them sometimes to be very crass, uh, sometimes very vulgar. Mm -hmm. So that is, I think, a fair assessment for a believer to make. And that's what many uh, modernists, lead many modernists to reject the Hadith or at least be skeptical of the Hadith. Now, I don't completely, I'm not a completely Quran only uh, Quranist or anything like that, but I am skeptical or cautiously skeptical of the Hadith. So I think that's legitimate. Now, from a scholarly perspective, from a historical uh, perspective, I would say many scholars, including non-Muslim academics, have realized that there's, a, there's this discontinuity between the Quran and the Hadith corpus. Um, now, they don't necessarily believe that the Quran is divinely inspired, but they do think that the Quran has a certain set of ideas and approach, and that doesn't, and, and that doesn't seem to match up with the Hadith corpus. In fact, I would go even a step further and say, I think the Hadith were generated and used in order to counter the Quran uh, because there were certain ideas in the Quran that didn't match up with later ideas in the tradition from a legal and theological perspective. And so you needed another, now because the Quran had become a closed scripture by this time, you needed another scripture. So first there became this idea of a dual scripture, which was uh, which is according to the tradition equally revelation compared to, to the Quran in the sense of its legal uh import actually it's superior in that sense now even though liturgically the Quran is considered superior um the hadith from a legal and hermeneutical perspective it's considered uh prior to or even superior to the Quran um so uh you needed a second scripture and that's why you had these hadiths that were generated in order to explain away Quranic verses that right. run afoul to the traditionalist ideas. Right. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. And and so if I can just ask uh, Dr. Hashmi, just from just from my knowledge, um, when you read the Quran, uh, do you find it to be coherent? Uh, if you didn't have the Hadith collection to you know act as the tafsir, the interpretation or the commentary, uh, how exactly do you look at it? You know, just just out of curiosity, do you find it that it's self-explanatory, or do you feel that no, you need to have knowledge of the history that's behind it, like the biblical tradition, the the non-canonical biblical tradition, etc., and all of that is what seeps into the understanding of the Quran. So, how would you look at it? Okay, so that's great. So that's uh, here's where I will explain that I'm not a Quranist. So a very strict Quranist would say. And this might be a caricature, by the way, so we shouldn't be uncharitable. There are more sophisticated Quranists out there. But I would say that uh, the most kind of crass or simplistic uh, Quranist idea would be that you could pretty much go to someone on a remote island, hand them the Quran, 
and say, read this, and it would make perfect sense to them. And you don't need anything else besides the Quran. And that's in its very strict sense. That's what kind of Quran only literally means. Now, like I said, they're more sophisticated Quranists. Now, um, so I don't agree with that. I think that the Quran needs to be contextualized. Now, that's why some people will say, aha, that's why you need the Hadith, right? You need the Hadith. You need the later tradition. You need the Asbab al-Nazul, the occasions of revelation. You need the Tafasir, the, the commentaries. You need all of that in order to understand the Quran. Otherwise, you can't do it. I don't agree with that either. So, uh, and, and I don't think uh, Western historians or historical critical scholars agree with that either. So, um, we believe that the Quran needs to be contextualized, but instead of looking what came after the Quran, yeah. we really look at what came before the Quran and what was available at the time of the Quran's pronouncement in the seventh century. And that's why there's this been there's this push in Quranic studies to understand the Quran as a late antique text. And so then you look at other texts and ideas and stories that were around in the late antique period to understand and contextualize the Quran. So, And you hinted at this in your question. So I do think that you need to look at the Bible and parabiblical traditions, for example, in order to understand Quranic stories. And without doing that, you may actually misunderstand and misinterpret certain things. So you had an, a one guest on before, Professor Gabriel Reynolds. He's uh, written on this as well, where he actually shows that you can actually misunderstand or not appreciate the Quranic um, idea if you are not familiar with that. Uh, sure. those parabiblical ideas. And yeah. I think that's correct. And I think it is true that Muslims today, we miss out on a lot of that because soon it became, you're not even supposed to read the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, that stuff is haram and forbidden. Don't read that. Um, and so we cut ourselves off from the very uh, textual tradition that the Quran is responding to and yes. part of, a culmination of. And so... Uh, Yes. So you need to use all of that. As far as the Hadith and what came after it, I do think that you need a basic skeletal outline of the Prophet's life story in order to really make sense of the Quran. Mm -hmm. So Western historians now do believe that we can use that um, kind of the low def version of the Prophet's life story. But as far as the high def version, which kind of narrates every single detail of the prophet's life, including how he sat on the toilet, how he you know, slept. Uh, this is all my fabrication of a later generation.